Hello, Michael here with another Renderman tutorial. Uh, so a lot of people are new to Renderman 21, it seems. I've noticed a lot of traffic on my previous Renderman uh, rendering basics tutorial. So I just wanted to uh, sort of update that tutorial with one for 21. So I'm just gonna go over the basics of your render settings uh, for Renderman and have a look at it, which is the uh, image uh, render previewer that uh, Pixar has created. So if you want to get to your render settings, the easiest way to do that um, is to click this button here, which will just give you your render settings. Um, so the first page comment is basically the same, if not exactly the same as your um, as you, what you'd be used to if you used Maya before. You've just got your image format, uh, which can be set to any number of things. Um, if you haven't seen my linear workflow tutorial, you may want to check that out. I talk a little bit about um, different file types as to why you would want to use them. Um, and then probably the next most important thing is image size. Uh, this is what you would use to set the resolution of your image. I'm going to be working in 960 by 540 just for the sake, uh, just for the sake of speed of render uh, while I'm recording this tutorial. And because I've got the camera, uh, the screen recorder on, I'm going to be rendering a little bit slower than normal. So with that all that covered, um, you can just move on to your sampling tab, which is where uh, RenderMan has made a few changes. They've sort of simplified things quite a lot. Um, so by default, this is what you'll see when you open it up. You'll have minimum samples and maximum samples. Uh, and this is talking about your final render settings. So uh, there's two buttons for rendering on the RenderMan shelf. There's the IPR button, which will give you an interactive preview render, which means you can move the camera around and it'll update the render live as you change things. Um, it doesn't allow you to change all things, like you can't move geometry in the scene and it won't it won't update where that geometry is moved to if you do move it. But you can change things like lights and textures and things like that. Um, so that's IPR, which is covered by this uh, tab here. But we're talking about final render, which is this button here. So if you click that, it will, t it will um, target these settings. So your max sample rate will basically uh, define what the quality of your images overall. So 128 is a fairly low sample rate um, and I'll show you what that looks like and what that sort of speed looks like. Actually we'll move through a couple of different sample rates just for example. So let's start off with a sample rate of 16 and uh, just click the render button and you'll see I've got it already open um, so when I click that render you'll start to see it render up on screen. Okay, so in it, um, you'll see that the render is finished. Um, on the left here, you'll see that I've got the catalog open. You can open that as well by going to Window and clicking Catalog or Hotkey C. We'll open it up and close it. Um, this will just show a list of all previous renders, which can be useful. Um, and the other thing that is useful, if I just close the catalog by clicking uh, hitting C, if I hit I um, or go to Window Inspector, it will show you your render stats. So it shows you the time that you render it, rendered it, um, the sample rate, so zero to 16, um, and the type of integrator uh, that I use, which I'll get to in a little bit, um, and the mode and um, the render time, which is the most important thing if you're looking to optimize your render times. So you can see at a sample rate of 16, I got a 13 second render, which isn't too bad. But um, if you have a look, if I zoom in a little bit, just by scrolling on the mouse, You'll see that this render is a little bit noisy. Um, you'll always notice noise in dark areas where it's transitioning from light to dark. And you can see it sort of between his legs there um, and sort of on his shoulder there and all over the place basically. If I click this button up here, it will just give me the uh, actual pixel ratio so I can look at it um, in its real size. So let's uh, jump up to a sample rate of 32 and render that again. Okay, so doubling the sample rate uh, to 32, we got a render time of 23 seconds, so not a huge increase. Let's double it again to 64 samples and do another final render. So you'll see that the render time's jumped up to 40 seconds, um, and I'll just do one more at 128, which is the default setting. 
All right, so that uh, last render was significantly longer, uh, clocking in at one minute and three seconds. Now, these render times are not bad at all by any measure. Um, however, the more complex your scene, so the more lighting and the more geometry, uh, the longer it will take to render. So this is a pretty low, um, low geometry and um, few lights in this scene. So um, overall, it's not gonna be a very long render time. If I hit C, um, it will bring up the catalog and we can quickly just make some quick comparisons. So you'll see a, a sample rate of 128. Most of that noise in between his legs there um, has completely disappeared. Uh, let's have a look at the 16 sample. By contrast, it is quite a lot worse. So as you can see, moving through the sample rates, we'll clean up that and smooth it out. Okay, let's uh, have a look at a couple of the other things on the sampling. Um, so pixel variance. Um, basically what this is talking about is what RenderMan will do is look at a pixel and look at the pixel next to it. Oh, sorry, it will look at a pixel and it will look at uh, the difference that has occurred between the previous pass and the current pass. And if not much has changed, it will um, it'll stop rendering that pixel to save time on the render overall because it may not be improving it in any noticeable way. So the smaller this number, um, the the less pixel variance you'll get, so the higher quality the render would be. Uh, but you may end up increasing your render time dramatically. So I think the default settings are just fine really. I've never really changed them. But if you're looking to optimize your renders and you've got a good idea of what your render is made up of, then you may want to start playing with those settings. However, starting out, I'd say that is fine. With that said, uh, the minimum times it makes a pass on a pixel is defined by the minimum sample field. So if you increase that sample field to be a higher number than zero, it will be forced to do a higher uh, amount of passes on that uh, on that pixel regardless of its pixel variance. So if you want to make sure that your render meets a minimum standard, you'd increase that. So knowing that what we know about what is above, IPR sample should be fairly easy to ascertain as to what it means. So 64 samples means it will render up to 64 samples. So if I click IPR now, I'm just going to move that off screen for a moment. Um, you'll see that it's starting to render and it's going to try and get to 64 samples but while it's rendering I can still move the camera around as you can see on the right hand side there and it'll update the render on the fly and I could also say for instance select a light uh, go to the attributes and uh, disable color or something like that or change the color to be red um, and then you'll see that it's changed the color of the light to red just going to change that back to what it was. So you'll see the render is still trying to get to 64 samples because it will restart basically every time I move the camera around. Um, you basically use IPR to uh, test your render quality, uh, your the, the light settings that you've got. So you might want to adjust the exposure of your lights if you think they're a little bit too low or their intensity or their color. You can basically do that on the fly and just keep getting an updated view of your render. So that's why it's really handy. Um, and pixel variance uh, works the same as what I'd said in previously. Um, integrator. If you're starting out, uh, you're probably going to be sticking with the path tracer by default. Um, it's pretty robust and it's going to be fine for most occasions. Uh, the only other integrator that you might consider using uh, for beauty renders it would be VCM which is really good for calculating caustics. Uh, caustics is when a light is passed through a transparent or translucent surface um, and then the light is focused in on a point. Uh, so you would see this when you've got a glass of water for, say for instance um, you'd see the light pass through there and create sort of a highlight on the surface that it's sitting on behind it. Um, so just for the sake of this tutorial, we're just going to look at path trace. So the way path tracing works is that um, RenderMan calculates each light ray um, and it's the path in which it travels and illuminates surfaces. So with it set to 10, it'll allow any ray in the scene that's vis uh, visible to the camera to make 10 bounces uh, before it terminates it. If you lower this, you'll get a lower quality render, like for instance, if I load it to I'll stop this so I can compare. If I lowered it to three and hit IPR again, you may be able to notice a difference. So um, back in it, I'll show you another thing that's quite useful. You can go to split image window, 
which will show the previous window and the uh, the previous render and the current render. So um, you can tell which one you got selected by uh, selecting the screen and then you can change uh, which one is in the screen by using the catalog on the left there. So I could change this one on the right to be um, say that 60, 16 sample final render that we did before or the most recent one. The one on the right is going to be the most recent one and the one on the left is going to be the uh, previous render. So uh, for this particular scene, um, you're actually not going to notice a whole heap of difference. Uh, so theoretically, the render on the right should be the lower quality um, render because it's got less bounce light. Um, however, because it doesn't appear that there's a lot of bounce light in the scene, it's not actually showing a big difference. So let's do a new IPR um, and let's change the max path length to one. All right, so you can see now that this has made quite a bit of a difference. Uh, if you look at the bounce light here on the left-hand side of our robot, you can see the light from behind is hitting the surface here and bouncing inside here. So you can see uh, this indirect illumination happening. Whereas with only one, uh, one bounce being traced, you can see that there is no bounce light occurring. What this means is that you're only seeing the direct light coming from each light source hitting the object. You're not seeing any um, bounce light occurring. So this is a good way to uh, speed up your render time. If you think the quality looks fine at three, then you could just stick with that. Um, if you increase this, I don't believe it updates in the IPR without actually clicking IPR again. So it's useful to sort of do that. Um, now I'm going to close the uh, image, uh, the split image by going to window, close split image. And you'll see that um, I've actually closed the one on the right, which was the one that was updating. So I want to make sure that I go back to the current one on using the catalog um, and you know, I can see the update happening. A um, couple of more settings that realistically I don't think you should worry about when um, you are starting out. Uh, all these by default are going to be fine if you're looking to optimize your renders. Once you have a better understanding of render man then by all means get back into this uh, but all of this is fine starting out. The only thing that you might consider is allow caustics which is uh, what I explained before with light rays being transmitted through a transparent or translucent surface creating a highlight. Um, accumulate opacity or cum opacity uh, basically you're pretty much not going to use this if you're starting out. This is something that's really only used in compositing uh, for alpha values. So uh, you can pretty much leave that one dis deselected. The next two tabs I would leave by as default because I think you're probably just going to mess up your render by um, playing with them. If you're really looking to optimize your render, I would do it in your sample settings and then maybe further down in your integrator settings. Um, the only thing that might be useful to some people, if you know what a holdout is, this is where you uh, get your image plane subset, um, which is right there. Um, so keep that in mind. But if you don't know what that means, then do not worry about it. There is one more integrator that I would say that is worth knowing about. Um, well, there's a couple actually. Occlusion is quite useful. If you know what an occlusion passes, uh, this is how you would look at it. Basically, an occlusion uh, looks at your model. It's ignoring any light source, really. It's just looking at um, how close all the geometry is to each other. And then it's sort of accentuating the shadows in the uh, smaller cracks area. So you can see that it's really dark in between his fingers there and that, that um, sort of that sort of channel that's in the platform that I've got there and then under his feet as well. Um, however, there's no real cast shadow happening. It's all to do with sort of uh, proximity. Um, so if you were compositing, this is one way that you could be, you could get your occlusion layer rendered out. Um, however, if you don't know anything about that, I wouldn't worry about it for now. I will be doing a separate tutorial on render passes uh, like I did for RenderMan 20. So look out for that if you want to know more. Uh, the other thing you might want to look at is the visualizer because uh, it gives you your wireframe, which can be quite useful if you're trying to do some cool renders where you show a plane between your final render and your wireframe. If you're presenting something in a portfolio, it can be quite useful. Uh, don't look at my bad topology on this one. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to Path Tracer now. Uh, features, there's not a lot in here that I would, I would worry about. If you're animating, you might want to consider motion blur. Um, it's just going to you're just going to be able to control the way the camera is acting and emulate uh, real world motion blur that you get from a film camera or even some, uh, or even actually technically a um, 
digital camera would do it based on its frame rate. Um, and you can also do camera blur as well, but those aren't really useful unless you're doing animation. Uh, the other thing worth noting while in the features set is denoise. If you um, have denoise set to frame, um, it will do a pass at the end of your render to try and uh, smooth out any noise, like the noise that we sort of had here in between the legs in that dark, dark area. Um, this is GPU accelerated, so that may mean that um, it's quick if you've got a GPU. If you don't have a GPU, I don't know whether it will work or not. Um, and also I have heard that it's a little bit screwy on some AMD cards. I'm not 100% certain about that though, um, as I have got a GTX 980. Uh, passes, I won't cover this in this particular tutorial. I'll cover this in a separate tutorial, so don't worry about that one for now. Um, and advanced, there's not really much that I would get into here if you're just starting out. Um, linearized colors is a useful thing to keep in mind if you are working in linear workflow. If you don't understand linear workflow, you don't know what it means, you should know what it means if you're rendering. Um, check out my linear workflow tutorial, it will explain everything and the workflow will be the same in 21 as it is in 20. Um, the only thing finally to cover is the um, view in the it editor, or the it display. Um, you've got a couple of options as to uh, the image color space and the display color space. This has to do with linear workflow again. Um, generally you're going to have this set to linear and display space set to sRGB. Most monitors that you are looking through are sRGB. Unless you're using a TV for some reason then you might be using Rec 709 in that case. Uh, but I would say linear and I would say definitely check out my linear workflow tutorial because it would explain why you want to use that when exporting renders. And talking about exporting renders, if you do in fact want to do that, you can do that from this editor. If you go file, um, export file, um, you can export as a JPEG. Um, because of linear workflow, uh, if I exported this now, the gamma settings would get all jacked up. So if you do want to export as a, a JPEG and you're viewing this in linear, what you can do is go to catalog, burn and mapping on save, and then you can export it and your render will look correct as it looks here. Um, if you don't do this, you will notice a difference in the gamma settings. You can also change your file type here to something like OpenEXR, which will give you a linear file that you can open in Photoshop at 32-bit. If you don't understand that, like I said, check out that linear workflow tutorial. Uh, but that pretty much covers it for this basics tutorial. I hope that's uh, this has been useful to get you started on RenderMan 21, which has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed uh, this last week that I've been using it so far. Um, if you want to know more about RenderMan 21, I recommend checking out a couple of other tutorials I've got out already. Uh, the Pixar Surface one would probably be a good place to start. I also have RenderMan 20 tutorials, which most of which are still valid uh, workflows for RenderMan 21. So if there is something specific that you want to learn about and there's a RenderMan 20 tutorial, I'd recommend looking at that. But for now, that is pretty much everything. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, make sure you click that like button if you'd like to help me show this tutorial to other people on YouTube um, if you've liked it and you think other people should be able to find it easily. Um, and if you haven't already, try subscribing because I put up a new tutorial every week, except this week where I seem to be putting up multiple, multiple tutorials um, as I know there's a lot of people uh, chomping at the bit to learn more about RenderMan 21. So yes, thank you for watching um, and until next time, happy rendering.